Hey everybody, welcome to Ontario Nazarene's YouTube channel. My name is Lauren and I'm one of the pastors here at Ontario Nazarene. Thanks so much for checking us out today. We believe that you are not here by accident and that you have been created on purpose for a purpose. And we wanna help you discover what that is and what that means for your life. And so we have a special message just for you today. So sit back, enjoy, and if you'd like to know more about how to connect with us here at Ontario Nazarene, stay tuned to find out more at the end of the message. You know, we've been in this series on forgiveness, and today is the last message in this series. Uh, I began talking to you a bit about grace, because we had to understand grace. If you don't understand grace, we don't understand forgiveness. Uh, the depth of God's love for us, as Pastor Connie talked about there. We went and defined forgiveness. We talked about forgiveness and reconciliation, saying those are two different things. I, I can forgive without reconciling, and I can reconcile even without forgiving. And then we talked about forgiveness and justice. Where does justice play? Because sometimes we feel like, okay, um, I mean, I've been wounded by somebody and uh, they've prayed for God to forgive them, but where, where, where does the making it right come from? So we talked about that. And then last Sunday we talked about lament. W what happens when we just feel like, man, we have, uh, we think God's been unfair. And how do we handle that? How do we look at that? And we looked at Psalms 22 and that Psalms are uh, about a third of the psalms are psalms of lament, psalms of grief. And those are important to look at. God is not afraid of our questions or of us being honest with him. And I've been using this phrase throughout this series that um, hurting is natural. It's natural. It's what we do. We hurt each other. <laughs> I hurt you, you hurt me. And, and in this broken world, that's what happens. That's why we're doing this whole series in Sunday School Ministries and on... The, the messy table. The church is messy. There's no perfect people here. But forgiveness, forgiveness is supernatural. It's the supernatural work of God that empowers us because we've experienced his grace to bestow that grace and forgiveness to others. In this series, as I've written these messages, there have been messages that I've had to, to write that have been much more difficult than this one. And yet this message may be the most difficult to live out. When I, was, when I was in high school and competing in track and field, there was a, a track meet that finished up and didn't feel like I had done very well. I'm pretty frustrated with myself. And you, you need to know, my, my oldest brother, um, he passed away a couple years ago, but about 18 years older than I am. And uh, he was kind of like a dad in many ways. And so we went to all my meets and invested in my life and so grateful to him. Um, but he came up to me afterwards and asked me about the race. And, and then after I was frustrated with my performance, he looked at me and said, Tim, you are your worst enemy. And he was so right. And those words have stuck in my mind uh, for the last 45 plus years. And maybe those are words you identify with. When it comes to forgiveness, for some of us, it may be easy for us to forgive others, but not so easy to forgive ourselves. That grace is great for everybody, except me. Any of you feel that way? Our metaphor for this series has been a locked door, a locked door by which there's a key right there, and we're, it, we're locked inside. The key is available, but we don't use it. And today, this message, this message is for everyone. It doesn't matter whether you're a follower of Jesus or not. These ideas of can I, can I, can I work through the, the areas of my life that I regret, that I wish didn't happen, can I forgive myself? So I want to start this, um, I, and eventually I'm going to have a section of the scripture I want you to turn to, but for right now, I, I want to set a scene for you, and it may be helpful. You may just want to close your eyes and, and picture the scene. Just live in it for a little bit, if you would. I want to take you this morning to a shore along the Sea of Galilee. Jesus has risen from the dead. It's early in the morning, and you can feel the warmth of the sun as it comes up 
over the horizon. The shoreline is gray from the dew that is on it. You, you're in a fishing boat with the disciples. You've been up all night and you've had one of those great fishing experiences. You caught nothing. Nothing. As you look over to the shoreline, you see the smoke of a campfire and a man standing next to it, but you don't recognize who he is. And like every person who stands on the shore and sees a boat and it's close enough, they look at you and say, did you catch anything today? And you hang your head low and you say, I got nothing. And then the man gives you a weird request. He says, would, would you throw your fishing nets one more time to the right side of the boat? You know that some people in the boat are professional fishermen. They know that the best time to catch fish in this area of the world is at night. It's early in the morning. You've been up all night. You're tired. You're frustrated. You're weary. You think the man's a little crazy. But you say, I'll do it. You throw the net over the right side of your boat. And just in the moment you do that, you lose your balance because the boat begins to tilt to one side. And there's something about this that seems familiar to you. It's like you've been there before. You look over and you see this young disciple by the name of John and he looks at the man on the shore and then you see him look at Peter and he says to Peter, Peter, it's Jesus. Peter quickly grabs his cloak because <laughs> he didn't have many clothes in that day, didn't have a closet full, so sometimes you fished with very little on, let's just say. Peter grabs his cloak, jumps into the water, swims as fast as he can to get to the shore to see Jesus. You and the other disciples grab oars and begin to row your way in, and others are trying to gather all of the fish in. When you get there, when you get on shore, you smell the bread. Smell that this morning. You smell the fish that had been prepared for you. Jesus begins to count the fish. You watch him do that. He looks at the loaves of bread, starts to count the number of men who are there, and he says, we're going to need more fish. And he gets the word out for the disciples to go. And before he can go very far, he sees Peter already running there all by himself. And Peter yells out, hey, I got this. I have it. I'll take care of those 153 fish. And in just a little while, you find yourself in a group of eight to ten men around a campfire eating breakfast. As you sit there, you smell the smoke from the open fire. You look over at Peter and wonder what he's thinking. You wonder if he's flashing back to the evening before Jesus died. Jesus had predicted that all the disciples would desert him. And you remember Peter looking at Jesus and, and at all the other disciples, and saying out loud with great boldness and great pride, Jesus, they may deny you. They may go and fall away. But I, only, I will even die for you. Jesus had warned him that before the rooster crows in the morning, that Peter would disown him three times. And one of those times is along a campfire. You wonder if this scenario is playing over and over and over in Peter's head. As you move your attention away from Peter, though, and you look at the other men around the campfire, you feel this tension of unresolved 
issues with the group because they know what Peter did. They know what Peter said. At the end of the breakfast, Jesus looks at Peter and says, let's go for a walk. You watch them as they walk along the shoreline. This encounter is written down in John 21, verses 15 through 19. I want us to look at it this morning. Would you stand as we read God's word together and listen to the dialogue between Peter and Jesus? John 21, 15 through 19. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, would you say the next four words with me? Do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. And Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, give me those last two words, would you? Follow me. Father, may we understand the grace that you want to bestow to all of us today. I pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said, may be seated. One of the things that I would like us to look today is, I'd like us to understand today is this, is that we are all Peter. We're all Peter. We all have regrets. Some of our regrets may be that we were too busy pursuing a career instead of investing in our family. We wished we could do that time over again. Maybe we spent too much time with another woman or another man that wasn't our spouse. And maybe nothing happened physically but emotionally and we regret that. Maybe we said some inappropriate things or we let our anger get out of control. We wish we could take those words back. Maybe we cheated on our taxes or a test and took advantage of a situation. And down inside, we just regret that. Let me clarify something. Not all guilt is the same. There is false guilt. False guilt is the guilt we feel for things that we had no control over. For instance, you're the child of a divorced family and you think, you've thought for years, this is, this is my fault. It's my fault that this happened. That's false guilt. It's not your fault. It wasn't because of you. Mom and dad made a decision, but you've lived with that. Or somebody tries to make you feel bad because they live their daily life different than you do. <laughs> I remember the story of a, of, a, of a pastor who goes to this little country church. And he's been there several weeks when suddenly he gets this phone call at 5 a.m. in the morning. It's a farmer. Farmer says, good morning, preacher. Hey, it's 5 o'clock in the morning. I'm getting up, getting ready to go to work. Thought you'd like, to, like a phone call this morning. Pastor said, oh, okay, whatever, um, okay. You have a great day, preacher. Thank you, hangs up. Every day for the next month, that farmer calls at 5 a.m. in the morning. Good morning, preacher. I'm getting up, ready to go to work. Thought you'd like a wake-up call. Hope you have a great day. See you, click. A month or so later, the pastor um, Gets home about 11 p.m. at night. He had a hospital call, emergency call that he was at on. And I don't know if it was the Holy Spirit or just honoriness. But he thinks to himself, well, self, let's see if this works. And he gets on the phone and he calls the farmer. 
and, of course, wakes him up at 11 p.m. And he says, hey, farmer, just want you to know, I just got home from a hospital call. It's 11 p.m. I'm just heading to bed. Hope you have a great night of sleep. Click. He didn't get any other phone calls at 5 in the morning after that. By the way, thank you for never doing that to me. Just want to say that out loud. But you see, somebody's expectation had been put upon him that he didn't have any control over or didn't even fit where he was at. And, and sometimes there are expectations that are put upon us that neither, we neither agreed to nor we wanted, but we feel guilty. We feel guilty because we're not doing it. And that's false guilt. However, there is such a thing known as godly sorrow. Paul writes about it in 2 Corinthians 7. He says it this way. He says, well, godly sorrow, here's what godly sorrow is. Godly sorrow is the emotion and feeling we have when we know we've done something that God doesn't want us to do or something we know would intentionally hurt somebody else. We feel guilty inside. It hurts. We feel bad. That's godly sorrow. And what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7 is that godly sorrow should lead us to repentance. But I mentioned in an earlier sermon, I think it was probably even the first one, I said, here's the problem. We don't like guilt. Our culture wants to do everything to remove guilt. In his book on forgiveness, Tim Keller uh, talks about the philosopher Frederick Nietzsche, I believe was an atheist, and Nietzsche said... um, He believed that if you could reject religion and God and moral boundaries that faith put on people, then you would remove guilt and shame. That's what he felt. That's what he believed. The problem is that doesn't work. Because you see, God created in us a compass, a moral compass. And whether you're a follower of God or not, uh, you got to know that you, you know when you've done something wrong. Yet, we want to deal with the brokenness that sin causes us by thinking we can fix it ourselves. So we just think, maybe we can remove guilt, or if we can't, I'll just try to fix it myself. So one of the interesting parts of the story with Peter is that if you notice, Jesus says, go, you disciples, go get some of those fish because I don't have enough here. And there's 153 of them. Go get a few of them and bring them over. And did you notice the passage says only one guy went? Do you know who it was? It's Peter. And I happen to wonder. Happened to wonder, is Peter going there on his own because he's saying, look, look, Jesus, uh, I just want to make it right. Um, I just want to, I want everything to be okay, and I want you to know I can take care of this. I got this, Jesus. You don't know where, I just want you to know everything's going to be okay. I just want to earn your love. I, I, I want you to know that. I want to earn your trust again. Here's the thing. We can't fix ourselves. That's what the story of God tells us. And that's why Christianity, Christianity is more than a faith of morality. Jesus is not just a good example. Jesus is our redeemer. He's our savior. We can't fix ourselves. Regrets are not bad. Regrets can teach us or they can defeat us. We all have those moments in our lives. I I would believe if we could all sit around some round tables and have conversation, we could all come up with some things that we wished we would have done differently. But I want us to take what time we have left this morning and look at this encounter with Jesus and Peter and see if we can't learn some things that can help us to live into the area of forgiveness rather than lock ourselves in a room of unforgiveness. So here's some things you can learn. A couple of things, three things in particular. First of all, notice that Jesus offers grace to Peter. I want you to see Peter's reaction to seeing Jesus. Notice that he immediately jumps, he immediately jumps into the water and swims as fast as he can to him. Now, I told you that when you were listening to the story, that this might sound a little familiar to you, the story of John 21. If you have read your Bible at all, you'll know there's a story in Luke chapter 5. But it doesn't happen after the resurrection. It doesn't happen at the end of the story. It actually happens at one of the first encounters Peter has with Jesus. And there's a lot of the same scenario. Peter's in a boat, been fishing all night, caught nothing, 
Jesus says, throw the nets on the other side of the boat. They do it, and the boat's overflowing with fish. But what's the difference? Here's the difference. In Luke chapter 5, when Jesus performs this miracle, Luke, or Peter says to Jesus, get away from me. Get away from me. I'm a sinful man. I don't deserve to be in your presence. And in John 21, what does he do? In John 21, he jumps out of the boat, swimming as fast as he can to get to Jesus. Why the difference? Peter knows Jesus. He knows the good news. He has watched Jesus. He's watched him come along a number of people. We could make lists of people by which Jesus has encountered. And when he's done with the encounter, what does he say? You are forgiven. And if you're forgiven, if Jesus is willing to forgive them, Peter's thinking in his mind, maybe he's willing to forgive me too. So let me ask you, here's the question. Here's the question. Are you more like Peter in Luke 5? Or are you more like Peter in John 21? Be honest with yourself. Between you and God, where do, where do you rate yourself? Do you run away from Jesus because of your guilt? Or do you run to him because of his grace? Where are you at? I think there are lots of reasons why people don't go to don't, or stop going to church or don't come back. One of them is that if I go, I know I have to deal with my stuff. It's not that people won't love me. It's not that they won't welcome me. It's that I know there are things in my life that I'm ashamed of and I've been unwilling to deal with it. Some of you may be watching online today because that's kind of where you're at. And I just want to tell you, so glad you're joining us online. And yet, whether you're here in the building or online, I want to see you set free from this locked door of unforgiveness. And I want to tell you that there is power and freedom in confession. I appreciate Peter's final statement to Jesus. When Jesus asks him those three times, do you love me? Peter says, Lord, you know all things. Friends, don't think he doesn't know what's going on. He does. And he wants to welcome you back in. Grace, grace is bigger than you can imagine. There's one character we don't talk much about around the Easter story. And it's the character of Judas. Now, Ju you, Peter's the denier, but Judas was the betrayer. And when I look at the encounter of Jesus with Peter, maybe you see this too. I believe with all of my, maybe you know the story, Judas will eventually, he will kill himself because he feels such guilt and such shame. I have every reason to believe by what I read in the entire Gospels and into the Old Testament as well, that if Judas would have come to Jesus, he would have experienced grace. And that's what God wants to give us. Jesus is saying, Peter, I love you. I'm right here. Jesus offers grace. Secondly, I want you to notice Jesus calls Peter to take responsibility for his actions. He's not going to let him deny what he did. Three times, Jesus will ask Peter, do you love me? And I want you to notice for the first time he asks, he says to Peter, do you love me more than these? Oh, do you think that stung? Absolutely. Peter's got that tape playing in his head. He's the, remember, he's the one who said, hey, they, these guys, they may, they may betray you, but I won't. I'll die for you. I think that's stung a bit. If there's stuff in your life that's unconfessed, I would invite you to tell Jesus what it is. He already knows it. You ever, you ever, maybe you lived this out in your own life, um, you ever been at that place where you, you, you know you're lying and you constantly have to cover it up 
because a lie works like that. You say it, you know you lied, but now, okay, I gotta think about who I just said that to, so you're constantly looking over your back, and do you know, do you ever, then finally somehow it comes out, and you confess it, and do you remember the weight as a kid that would come off your shoulders when, when finally um, it got called out? Some of you today are living in godly sorrow but unwilling to say, okay, this is what I've done. And God's calling you to himself. And he's saying, I want you to take responsibility. You gotta say, this, okay, this is what I did. And, and, and Jesus, I'm asking you to forgive me. And I think you lead from the point where, where Jesus um, says to Peter, do you love me more than these? And then Peter in the end says, you know. You know all things. You know what I did. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. So he commissions him back into his mission. So the third thing is that Jesus reinstates Peter to his mission. For every time that Peter denies Jesus, Jesus asks him, do you love me? When Peter responds, Jesus reminds him of his mission. Feed my sheep. Love Love is an important piece. Do we love Jesus? Do we love Jesus more than anything else in our life? Jesus doesn't want to be second place. He wants to be first. And we can let so many things get in our way to make him second or third or fourth down our list. Do you love me? And then, I'll, you know, the very last thing that Jesus says to Peter is the same invitation he gave him at the beginning. Follow me. Follow me. It's the invitation he gives to us. There's a humorous part to the story if you go and read on. Because as they're walking down the beach, you get this impression that, and I believe it's John is walking, with, walking behind them. Maybe John's the eavesdropper trying to take it all in. So Peter and Jesus have this encounter, and, and uh, Peter looks at Jesus and says, well, what about him? What about him? And I love what Jesus says in that moment. He says to him, he's none of your business. He's none of your business. Um, sometimes we get into a comparison game. Well, if I could only, if I, what about if I could be, Jesus does not need us to be performers. He needs us to be repenters. It's not about being like somebody else. You know, I wished I could play the guitar like Eddie. I just can't. I'm over here watching Brandon playing the drums. I got no other rhythm. I wish I could, I wish I could do math really well, but you get me to fractions and I'm a done deal. I can't, if I do all the comparison stuff, I'll never measure up. But in our relationship with Jesus, what Jesus is interested in is our heart. It's, it's in our brokenness and not in our giftedness that God can use us. So, let me ask you this morning. What is your biggest regret in life? You might write where you're at right now. Write that down. Or at least write it in your mind. What is your biggest regret? There was a little exercise done um, from students at Strayer University. They set up a chalkboard on the sidewalk for one day. And at the chalk, top of the chalkboard was written these words, write out your biggest regret. Put a bunch of colored chalk down and watched people. And people actually went and started to write down their regrets. They wrote things like burning bridges, Never speaking up. Not being a good husband. Should have spent more time with family. Staying in my comfort zone. Not saying I love you. Never applying to med school. Not making the most of every day. Not being a better friend. They noticed as they looked at the list, there was a common thread. It was the word not. They were about chances not taken. They were about words not spoken. They were about dreams never pursued. But then 
They gave every person an eraser and they wrote on the top of the board, clean slate. And people could come up, go where they had written theirs and wipe it clean. And one woman responded, she said, in doing this, with tears in her eyes, I feel hopeful. It means that there are possibilities. Erasing the regret makes us stop looking backwards and start looking forwards. Years ago, John Maxwell wrote a book called Failing Forward. We all have regrets. But by the grace of God, we don't have to look back at those. We can experience his forgiveness and we can start looking forward and saying, what is the new life that you have for me? And that's what God wants to do in each of our lives. I entitled this message, Let It Go. No, I'm not going to break out in song from that Disney musical. Yeah, some of you know that song. You either children or grandchildren. Let it go. No, stop. Anyway, <laughs> some of you today, you need to let it go. You need to confess your sin, accept God's forgiveness, and forgive yourself. Some of you, you've been holding on to stuff. And in your pride, you haven't been, you haven't been willing to confess it. And today I invite you to do that, right where you're at. In just a moment, we're going to stand, and you can tell God, God, I am so sorry for what I did. You can look back in that moment. You can write it up on the board, but then God's going to take an eraser, and he's going to hand it to you and say, you can erase that because you're forgiven. Some of you, though, some of you need to let go of the feeling of guilt and shame. You've confessed it. You've received forgiveness, but you're locked behind the door of shame and guilt. Again, the metaphor. See it? Locked door, key on the table. I'm inviting you to give that key to God today. You can't change what's been done, but you can learn from it. You can move forward. You can see the possibilities instead of the failures. I think that's what Jesus did for Peter, and that's what he wants to do for you. Would you like to leave here today without carrying that? Is that a weight you've been hanging on to? Jesus is pulling you from around the campfire this morning. He's going to walk down the shoreline with you. Do you love me, he says. Why don't you tell him? In so doing, hand him the key and watch the door crack open. Watch yourself be set free. He has the ability to do that. Did Peter mess up again? Sure he did. And you may too. But I think Peter is a different person because God took his failures, forgave them, and Peter learned from them as he moved forward. Well, I hope that was a helpful and a meaningful message for you today. And if you would like to speak with anyone about the message or about anything going on in your life, we would love to connect with you. And there are many ways that you can do that. To connect with us, you can send us a message through our website, ontariofirst.org. We'd also love to have you like us on Facebook or, or send us a message through Facebook Messenger. And you can also follow us on Instagram at Ontario Nazarene. We'd also like to invite you today to subscribe to this channel by hitting the big red subscribe button. And then click on the bell next to it so that you'll get notified whenever we upload a new video. And as always, we are right here every Sunday morning for worship service at 9.30 and 11 o'clock a.m., both in person and online. Thanks again for joining us today, and we hope you've enjoyed your time with us. And we do hope to see you again real soon.